morning, everyone. It's so nice to see so many of you here this morning. It's a wonderful service today, pet memorial service. We have uh, pictures of um, dear pets and uh, song of members that lost during this past year. And I'm sure we have all had uh, a pet uh, or two or maybe even more over the course of our lives that have been an in integral part of our own families, maybe as close to us as, uh, as our best friend. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple of pets uh, in my life over the, over the course of many years. And I want to talk about the very first pet dog that we had on our family farm. I grew up in Oregon in a small rural community. My dad was a farmer and there was a stray dog that just came onto our farm. You know, in the rural area, sometimes there would be cats and dogs that would just kind of come onto your, your land, onto the farm, and kind of make themselves at home. So there was this, this uh, stray dog, kind of a short dog, and at first as kids, you know, myself and my cousins, we kind of tried to chase it away. It kept coming back, kept coming back, and so we let him stay, and then became our beloved pet. We named him Shorty because he was a little short dog with short legs. Soon Shorty became the watchdog for the farm. Whenever a strange car would come into the farm, then Shorty would bark. But Shorty never barked for our cars or one of our workers' cars. He knew the difference. So it's really good to have a watchdog on your family farm. So we grew up with Shorty during my elementary school years. But Shorty got uh, older, and he got weak, and, and he was dying. I remember we were trying to help him. We knew he was uh, kind of sick, and, and maybe he might die. And my cousin was on some kind of medicine from the doctor. I even snuck in and got one of her pills, and I was trying to feed, <laughs> feed the medicine to Shorty to see if it could help him. Uh, unfortunately, I guess maybe he didn't take it, but uh, we, you know, we were all doing what we could to try to keep Shorty alive. But, as we all know, uh, our pets cannot live forever, and especially they do not live as long as we humans, and one day Shorty died. But, on our farm, you know, our farm's busy, we have many workers, and especially at harvest time, it's so busy. When Shorty died, the whole farm stopped. All work stopped. And we, and my dad and the workers, we all gathered and we had kind of an orchard just for our own uh, fruit to eat next to one of our fields. So we, we buried Shorty in the orchard. And two of our workers dug his grave and we placed Shorty in his grave. And you know, we all said goodbye. The whole farm stopped. It was the first funeral that had a real impact on me. And it was the funeral or uh, burial of our beloved dog, Shorty. So I'll always remember uh, that experience and sort of making me realize you know, what really is his life, what is really life. The second pet I want to talk about is another dog that we had, and this is when I was a more high school, college age, and his name was Spot. He didn't have a single spot on him. I don't know why we call him Spot. But we got him as a puppy, and then uh, he was, the, of course, like Shorty, uh, the watchdog for the farm, and beloved pet. Now, during this time, I was starting to study Buddhism, at the University of Oregon. And one of my courses on Buddhism was on Zen Buddhism. And in Zen Buddhism, they have what are called koans. Koans are like uh, spiritual puzzles for the young monks to reflect on, to try to break through to enlightenment. For example, one of the famous koans is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Like, what does that mean? sound of one hand clapping. So you're supposed to think of this and, and then you have to go in front of the Zen master and give your answer. Another famous koan is, does the dog have Buddha nature? Does the dog have Buddha nature? So let's say I was a, a Zen, young Zen monk 
and I'm training, and the Zen master gives me this koan. Does the dog have Buddha nature? That is your koan. So I have to go in front of the Zen master. He says, what is your answer to the koan, does the dog have Buddha nature? I say, well, yes, I think the dog has Buddha nature. Well, he hits me over the head with a stick. Wrong answer. Oh, gee. Come back tomorrow. So I meditate some more. Next day, go back. What is your answer to the koan? Does the dog have Buddha nature? So I think to myself, well, yesterday I said yes, and he hit me with a stick. No, the dog does not have Buddha nature. Wow, he hits you with a stick. Here. Gee, I say yes, he hits me. I say no, he hits me. What is the answer? See, it's not a yes or no answer. That's, that's the tricky thing about these koans. Something has to come from you that shows your, your religious understanding. For example, like the sound of one hand clapping. I don't have an answer to that, but I heard a very enlightened answer. Sound of one hand clapping <coughs> is this. We pat ourselves on the back. We become arrogant and so proud. You know, that's a very enlightened answer, I think. So, let's say I heard this from someone. Oh, that's a good answer. I'll, I'll give that answer to the Zen Minister. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Wham! He hits me over the head with a stick. But he said that was a good answer for that other guy. No, that was his answer. That's not your answer. See, so it has to be, it has to come from you, and the Zen master could tell whether you're copying someone else's answer or if it comes from your being. So I was reflecting on this koan, does a dog have Buddha nature? When I would go home from school holidays, and our dog Spot, you know, would the Spot have Buddha nature? He can't listen to the Dharma, he can't read books on Buddhism. Does Spot have Buddha nature? And then one day, Spot did uh, kind of a bad thing. He chewed up one of my dad's slippers, so I scolded him, you know, don't do that, Spot. So I scolded Spot, and he ran away, you know, kind of hid for a little bit. About one minute later, Spot comes back. And, and he wants to play, and he's jumping on my lap, and, and, and I thought, wow, I just scolded Spot a minute ago, and right away he forgets about it, he wants to, he wants to be friends again. Am I like that? No. If my parents scold me, I don't talk to them for a day or two, you know? And it doesn't get any better as you get older. You know, people think that someone who is enlightened, like the Buddha, never gets mad. But that's not the case. Buddhism says, no, Buddha's enlightened people, they get mad. The only difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person is that for an enlightened person, their anger doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. They don't hold on to their anger for days weeks, months, years, like we do. I want to share an experience that I had many years ago. You know, as a minister, you really try not to have an argument with a member. You know, you really shouldn't. As, as you always try to avoid that, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And you're going to have kind of a heated discussion about something. And I remember having a rather heated discussion <laughs> with a member, he said this, I said that, and you know, this conversation went on. And then years later, years later, I'm taking a shower in our house, and for some reason that experience comes back to me. And I'm thinking about that, that argument I had. He said this, I said that, he said that back. I should have said this, but I didn't say it, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm replaying that, that experience. And in our house, my, my wife made this rule. After you take a shower, you have to take this plastic squeegee, and you have to squeegee the, the, the shower stall. And that keeps it looking nice and clean. So, so I'm, having, I'm recalling this conversation with this, this art that I had. And now I'm squeegeeing the, the shower stall. And, mm, mm. 
this plastic squeegee snapped in two. <laughs> I broke the plastic squeegee. I was squeegeeing so hard. And it was this like awakening thing like, what is the matter with you? And I'm thinking, how long ago was that? I couldn't even add up the years. Years ago, easily 10 or 15 years ago, I had that argument. But it's still right there. It's still right there. I'm still holding on to it. 10 to 15 years later. So, my answer to the koan, does the dog have Buddha nature? Yes. Spot manifests his Buddha nature way more than me. Spot is way more enlightened than me. I, I don't let my anger go one minute later. I hold on, and I hold on, and I hold on. Let me share another story. This is a, a true story. I heard from uh, my wonderful teacher in Japan, Professor Shigaraki, and he knew a very devout member of his, elderly gentleman, and he shared this story. Once this elderly man was walking through uh, a field, a uh, rice paddy field, and some young boys, mischievous young boys, did sort of a very, uh, very uh, unkind thing, but they just thought it was, it was a mischievous thing. They jumped out of the bushes and they pushed this man into the muddy field and then they ran away laughing. Well, years later, some years later, when that one of those younger boys got a little older, he had kind of a guilty conscience about what he had done. So he went up to that elderly man and he said, you know, uh, Mr. So-and-so, years ago, some young boys pushed you into this muddy rice paddy. And one of those boys was me. I want to apologize for, for what we did you know, some years ago. But this, this now this uh, adolescent, he said, but you know, I always wondered, why didn't you get mad? You didn't run after us. You didn't try to find our parents and tell us what we had done. Why didn't you get mad? And this elderly man said, oh, I got mad. I got mad. But then I heard the voice of the Buddha saying to me, they're just boys. Let it go. Let it go. That, that's how an awakened person thinks. They have the anger, but they let it go. Now, this is not to say to young, you young people, you can do mischievous things, <laughs> and everyone's going to forgive you and let it go. And I'm not saying that. But, but, this very awakened person was, had his anger and then let it go, let it go. I have a little homework assignment for today's sermon. I want, even after today, this afternoon, sometime this week, I'd like you to think, look into yourself. Look into yourself. I'm sure we all carry something we're still mad about. Something someone said, something someone did, and it's still there. It's still there, and it continues to kind of eat away at us. The longer the time goes, weeks, months, years, don't all of you have these situations in your family? Thanksgiving time or New Year's and you're setting the, the table settings and who should sit here, who should sit there? Oh, no, no, don't put Auntie so-and-so next to uh, uh, Auntie such-and-such. -such. They don't get along, you know, so we got to put her here, put her over there. Like, uh, sometimes we have in our families, people don't speak to each other. <coughs> Something happened and, and we hold on to that anger. So think of what that was, and, and think about it. Ask yourself, how long am I going to hold on to this? How long? To the grave? So Buddha's going to say, we have to let it go. When we let it go, then our hearts and minds are lighter. And we find that when other things that happen to us when we're angry, Sure, we're going to get angry, 
but we can let it go. Someone cuts you off on the freeway, maybe before you, 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 you used to get angry and maybe say a few choice words to them. Now you can say, dozo, dozo, you know, please go ahead. <laughs> Reverend Kubose, whom I studied under, he used to give an interesting sermon. He used to say, you know, when you get mad, try saying the Nembutsu. Try saying no more He said, you'd be surprised at how quickly your anger goes away. So next time you get mad, now don't do this, don't go, no more Midobutsu, no more Midobutsu. <laughs> You're not releasing your anger like that, but if even if you say no more two one or two times, see now it, it's kind of bringing the dharma, and maybe it's it's saying to you in a subconscious manner, gee, should I be that uh, that upset about this? You know, maybe this is me. Maybe, maybe this is all me. Why I'm so upset. So it brings a little bit of self-reflection. It may not work all the time. Sometimes we might be too angry to say no more we don't see. But even a little later, if we calm down. Or take two deep breaths. Just just two deep breaths. And you find your feeling is quite changed from so mad. Just two deep breaths. I hope all world leaders, before they consider doing something uh, momentous, like going into war or something, they can just take two deep breaths. They might reflect on themselves and be calm. So Buddhism is saying, you can say no one without us, you can take a couple of deep breaths, but we can't hold on to our anger. And our pets, show us that they are more enlightened than we are. So today, in having this pet memorial service, we fondly call wonderful pets that have been a part of our family, like our best friends. They understand us when nobody else can understand us. We don't even have to say anything. Something beyond words. Our pets seem to understand our heart and mind. That is why they are true Buddhas because their heart becomes one with my heart. Not one else.